Irreverent, over the top, and smart as a whip. This is the Rob Black Show. Yesterday was a very positive day across the board. This has been a very strange, I'm going to call it mid-March, where January, February, and start of March was negative. Mid-March seems to be fighting up for a few days and then chilling. Like, hey, man, let's take a day off. It's not panicking. It's chilling. It's very interesting to me. Um, <clears throat> investors are tentative right now. I did a big story yesterday about Ian Shepherdson and how he's one of my favorite economists and how he predicted housing should start to freeze up as the average mortgage cost is now about $400 more. The median mortgage in the United States would cost you $400 more due to the higher borrowing cost difference between September 2021 and March of 2022. The average American doesn't have an extra $400 a month. And he thinks the average American, the median, is going to stop pursuing homes until everything kind of slows down or they kind of catch up. He made a big prediction yesterday and it started playing out by the afternoon. We'll talk about that as the show goes on today. Housing is dubious right now. 10-year treasuries made a move to 2.4%. I texted one of my professional friends in the middle of the morning, late morning, I was going to say middle of the night to you, start of the morning for me, for the morning. And, uh, I got a kind of a vulgar response. It was fantastic. I go, um, I didn't think the 10-year treasury. I said, the 10-year treasury is happening a lot faster than I thought it was going to happen. Because we started the year. <clears throat> with the 10-year treasury right around 1617, it goes to two. And I'm like, ah, it's going to go back and play one nine. It's going to go to two. I think it's 2-2, two, two. I think it goes back to 2, I think it's 1-9, I think it's 2-4. Like, it's kind of jumping forward, almost like a frog, where you're, you're like, oh, we got it. Nope, 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 we don't got it. Russian forces are suffering major losses. The U.S. senior defense official said yesterday, combat power has dropped by, to below 90%. So Russia seems to be more ruthless using bombing techniques from warships instead of boots on the ground. They're not using planes because they use the planes and they know they're going to get shot down. Anyway, what happens when you seize a yacht? I've always wondered. Sanctioned Russian oligarchs are getting serenaded by the world's smallest violin right now. In the State of the Union earlier this month, Biden promised oligarchs around the world that the West would seize your yacht. It's not a, I guess he didn't promise the oligarchs around the world. I guess he promised that Russian oligarchs, we will seize your yachts. Um, Italy seized Russia's businessman Alexei Mudashov real estate complex worth about $116 million. <clears throat> not a lot of details about what to do next. Litigation could take a long time. Yachts could get the equivalent of super wrinkly fingers from sitting in the water. Yachts need love. And when they're seized, you can't maintain them. So there's a bill being presented right now by U.S. lawmakers referred to Yachts for Ukraine Act, which I kind of like cash for clunkers, Yachts for Ukraine. I don't know. Turning Russian oligarchs' properties into funds that can aid Ukrainians might not happen until well after the war is over. Tesla started its big plant in Europe yesterday, and we got another video of Elon Musk dancing. Billionaire philanthropist donated $436 million. No, 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 not him. Uh, Elon Musk, the Giga Factory, the Car Factory, uh, the Battery Factory. The new German factory can produce 500,000 vehicles per year, which is more than the 450,000 battery electric cars that rival Volkswagen sold in 2021. So the Gigafactory in Austin is slated to open in April, making big strides from a company who started with a mass, <clears throat> with an overpriced vehicle that was 
promoted as the idea of it's going to lead to cheaper vehicles because we'll start making more factories. We can make more cars. Seattle voted, uh, 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 Starbucks in Seattle voted unanimously to unionize, becoming the seventh corporate owned store in the country to back a union and the first in the country's hometown. Improving labor relations will be at the top of CEO Howard Schultz's to do list. More than 150 company owned locations have filed for union elections in the past six months. This is interesting because <clears throat> Starbucks lost their CEO. He quit and it was kind of random. Remember, I always say success or failure starts at the top. It was kind of random. And back comes Howard Schultz, which would piss me off. Um, imagine your ex-wife continually goes back to her first husband <laughs> for advice and not you. Howard Schultz is that guy. Now, I like Howard Schultz. Wall Street likes Howard Schultz. But you get the point here. Like he, If you're going to retire, you need to stay retired. Same thing with Eisner from Disney. I know it's a weird thing, right? Both CEOs just kind of like stick around the headline news and kind of taking the love for the companies they led for such a long time. I think the market showed a pretty good amount of resilience in a very short amount of time. You've seen the NASDAQ, the 100, the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, the S&P mid cap 400, the Dow Jones industrial average all make big moves from their lows on March 14th, 12%, 12 12.4%, 8.4%, 8%, 7%, 6.1%. Again, talk about the move on the 10-year treasury. That's been kind of a bullfrog jumping when you just try to catch it. Not always moving forward, but more than less. Same thing with the markets. It feels like a bullfrog. You, You go, oh, we're going lower. And like, nope, it just jumped the other way. It's no surprise that market bulls aren't giving up so easily. They've been looking at large losses in 2022. Markets ongoing resilience in the face of negative developments has helped feed a narrative. And a lot of people feel like they're going to miss out on gains. It will be the price action and the trend that serve as the key drivers of investor sentiment in the near term. In the long term, it's going to be earnings. And that's kind of the next shoe to fall in our mind. Well, that's the one we're watching to see how, how much of a smack it gets. A lot going on, is it not? Crude oil's rising again, and the market's pulling back. Very short term. Again, bouncing around a little bit. Let's see what the next big move is, forward or backwards. President Biden is meeting with European NATO allies today, and the rhetoric coming out of Russia is uh, not happy. So those are your headline stories for the day. A couple other things to hit Okta, which is an identity confirmation company. And they're really good at authenticating. Uh, They said thousands of companies have been hacked. Oh no, one of their engineers lost his laptop for five days in January. January? And the story is just coming out. Change your passwords on a regular basis if you can, please. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. The fortune-making spirit of today's marketplace, the Rob Black Show. Questions about how to invest in your retirement? Check out robblackshow.com and get in on the conversation. Subscribe to the podcast and video channels. No one cares more about your money than you do. It's time to start to feel good about your financial future. Robblackshow.com robblackshow.com there is a lot going on as far as scratch your head now a couple of things i don't necessarily believe in or i don't want you to like go oh yeah yeah that makes sense when you hear it is when you hear someone say the stock market is set for more upside short term or the stock market is set up for more downside near term we are a headline driven market and so goes russia war so goes the market. So goes the 10-year treasury, so goes the market. In the long run, it's more about earnings, but in the short term, we are very headline driven. The former head of the SEC said the regulator is overstepping its uh, bounds, saying you really can't, 
watch those climate disclosure rules. You know how companies are like, we're going to be carbon neutral by 2030. And the former head of the SEC, the SEC looks at companies and says, because you're making a market, you have to register. And because you're registered, you have to give public disclosures. And because you give public disclosures, they have to be honest. And the former head of the SEC who enforced kind of the honesty of balance sheets and the honesty of information disclosure from corporations said, we can't monitor climate change, even though a company could say, uh, this year we're going to make a factory that turns air into, uh, or it turns bad air into good air. I don't know. He's saying it's like, <clears throat> no, no. The average 30-year fixed and break mortgage has climbed past 4% for the first time in three years. And it's put downward pressure on certain companies that are tied towards home builders in particular. The housing backdrop is still rooted in very solid fundamentals, but it's facing higher borrowing costs and higher commodity costs and higher labor costs, just to name a few of the concerns. I like the home builder stocks if we were in a normalized environment, but in a very high stress environment where the interest rates jump so quickly, again, I'm going to say like trying to catch a bullfrog. Mortgage rates are climbing and that has put downward pressure on home builders. The home builder index lost 20% during 2022. We would argue that the investors should not be ultra ruthless at this point in time and discard the companies and maybe say, do I buy more because the underlying theme is still there? that we need more homes in the United States. And these are companies like VR Horton, Lennar, Pulte Group, and NVR. I don't own any other than through indexes, but man, they look good on a balance sheet, but man, they're in an environment of mortgage rates jumping the wrong way for them to be moving easily. Mortgage rates are also jumping in large part because commodity costs and labor costs have jumped so much. Yesterday, NVIDIA had an investor day that was a hit. They came out with some crazy stuff. Crazy. And I own shares of NVIDIA. Um, and I'll tell you about some of the stuff that they uh, released yesterday. A super chip, for instance. And the stock went lower when all NASDAQ stocks went higher. So Wall Street's a little concerned that semiconductors are going to have a problem, number one, being manufactured. And number two, fighting for earnings moving forward. I still like the companies in the long term, but if you were to ask the crazy eight ball right now, is NVIDIA a good buy? And you're going to turn it over and it's going to say, ask again later. I can already tell you that. It's too murky right now. There's a Grace computer processing unit, super chip, which doubles the performance and energy efficiency of data center chips. It's designed specifically for artificial intelligence. Okay, so they got a Grace computer processor that they announced yesterday, a super chip, doubling performance and energy efficiency. Okay, 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 okay. The new Hopper graphics processing unit was another standout. They said that can be scaled to run massive AI models. Some $11 billion in contract pipeline for the automotive industry. They've talked about how their self-driving technology that they too are building, Tesla's building, uh, GM Cruise is building cars that can automate and drive themselves. They've announced $11 billion in the pipeline for what they have at NVIDIA. And think about it. If you play a video game like Gran Turismo and the graphics are beautiful and you, you creep up on a Porsche, you go, man, that thing looks like a real Porsche. It moves like a real Porsche. I'm going to whip around. I'm going to draft behind it. <laughs> NVIDIA has been doing video games that simulate driving for years so nvidia slipped telling you like what else do they need to do they came out with software for the omniverse ai driven they came out with metaverse virtual worlds industrial focus i feel very comfortable long term with the company but i'll be honest with you it's not great in the short term nothing's great in the short term until russia oil inflation 10-year treasury all start to calm down. Maybe even we could throw China in there. There's problems. Maybe, well, maybe we could throw COVID in, you say. Yeah, we could probably throw COVID in as well. See the problems? <laughs> they start to add up. Short-term versus long-term. Um, what did Mr. T say to Rocky or the announcer when they were doing their pre-fight? Mr. T, what do you predict for the, for the fight? And he goes, pain. 
short term, I think we're going to have a little bit of pain or, or just awkwardness. That first time you move in for a kiss when you're 16, 17 years old, 15 years old, and just, it's not her head's going the wrong way. Your head's going the wrong way. And it's just all wrong. That's where we are now. Thank you. That warrant that Mr. T drop was only about 34 seconds too late. Here we go. Mr. T should I invest in gold? He's like my, he's like my personal eight, Mr. Uh, eight ball, Mr. T eight ball. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. Call the doctors. Rob said a stroke. Other stories of note, BuzzFeed yesterday announced that it's laid off 1.7% of its workforce and is asking for voluntary buyouts in its news division. Three of its top editors are leaving. Um, hmm. Tesla's Berlin Gigafactory delivered its first uh, vehicles yesterday. And there was uh, Elon Musk saying, here's 30 Model Ys. Who wants the, your Model Y? Everyone scream Model Y, Model Y, why we like pie. Uh, just I, I find those things to be kind of silly. But you know what? I do want a big pair of scissors. You know what I'm talking about? When there's a ribbon cutting ceremony and they have these gigantic pair of scissors, I'm like, that would be cool. And just to use it like in my normal day, like someone needs scissors to walk around the office. Anyway, now I'm just talking stupid, right? Amazon has been dropped as a sponsor of the Seattle Pride Parade. Seattle Pride says it's cutting ties with the marketplace giant due to its financial donations to politicians who actively propose and support anti lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and a couple other letters in legislation. I really don't know what the I and the A stand for. So that's where we are now. We're at LGBTQIA, right? It's A, B, C, D, E. Google's Quantum Sandbox Group is spinning out as an independent company. That's nice to hear. VentureBack uh, Software as a System Business has secured funding from former Google CEO Eric Schmidt and Mark Benioff. That'll help create a little bit of value for the company. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube at Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. Brought to you by EP Wealth. This is the Rob Black Show. The 10-year treasury is perplexing to me. I started the show by telling you that I texted a friend at four in the morning going, I didn't really see this kind of jump. And it's not slow. It's not methodical. It's it's two steps forward, one step back, and three steps forward, one step back. That feels where my mind is on Wall Street right now. It's, It's like a bullfrog. You're trying to catch it as a kid, and it's not the easiest thing to catch. Markets are a little bit lower today. Um, first six weeks of the year, lower in the markets. Last couple of weeks, kind of a fight your way back attitude. And then it's going day by day, a little bit on the lumpy side. Now, I could use that as a horrible transition. Talking about, speaking of lumpy, let's go to Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com. Speaking of great financial information, let's go to Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com. How are you, Patrick? Hey, Rob. I'm doing well. Thanks. Um, it's kind of crazy out there the way the market's acting on a day-by-day level um if i were to you know bet the moment the market closes how it's going to go tomorrow i don't have a good sense of it um, what are you making of the markets these days right i think that's you know no one can really call the direction of the market um and i think everyone just needs to own up to it um because you don't know okay. what you're going to get from one day to the next um, but what we can tell obviously from you know long periods of history is that you know, uh, you can make an assessment of, you know, the fundamental character of a market that kind of will help you determine what the ultimate trend could be on a shorter term or even a longer term basis. Um, and so what we're seeing, I think, right now, primarily is just a, a rally predicated on on technical factors and, and money flows. Um, there is still a lot of money out there sitting on the sidelines. And, you know, when you get a shift, a sudden shift in sentiment, you get some of that market, uh, you know, chasing, you know, chasing performance. And uh, we're certainly seeing that this week, a little bit of a fear on missing out on some rebound gains. And, and to be fair, um, you know, you could have made a case that the you know, market had gotten oversold um, yeah. uh, with this early year sell off and was due for a rebound. And that kind of just all lined up perfectly with reports of Elevated cash positions, uh, reduced exposure on the part of fund managers to equities, uh, and uh, and sentiment readings uh, indicating that bullish sentiment was you know 
trolling levels that we saw back uh, in March of 2020. And so the, the, uh, what I'm driving at really is that the, uh, the ground was, was, I guess, ripe for, uh, for plucking here in terms of uh, forging a rally effort off of some oversold conditions. You may snicker at this since you have children, I have children, but there's a Japanese anime called Demon Slayer. And this will make sense in 20 seconds. Um, our Fed Chairman Jerome Powell is coming across, someone sent me a meme, and they basically took the anime Demon Slayer and they put his head on the got main character and they called it Inflation Slayer. We Historically, you and I have seen the Fed kind of make a mess out of ra- raising rates and trying to fight inflation and trying to control the economy. It's tough. It's it's like I've said, you know, it's like catching, you know, a tadpole. It's not the easiest thing. It's like catching a bullfrog. It, it'll jump right before you see it. Uh, do you think the Fed's up to this challenge? Because in the whole Russia, Ukraine and the higher oil, we already had inflation. Inflation was supposed to be transitory. It, it, do we have a hero in Jerome Powell or too early to tell? Well, I think, I think you have both a hero and a goat. Uh, okay. Because, uh, you know, the Fed has a lot of ability to get inflation under control. I mean, the Fed funds rate up to a week ago was at the zero bound. So it could raise rates, you know, you know, 300 basis points, 400 basis points, <laughs> however many basis points it wants to increase the Fed funds rate and kind of really put a lock on it on inflation. Um, you know, this Fed, however, uh, up until recently anyway, has sounded a little uh, hesitant to uh, to make any action, to take any action to <clears throat> bring inflation under control. But the, the narrative is shifting. Um, and we heard that from the Fed chair. We're now hearing it increasingly from other Fed officials, uh, Cleveland Fed President uh, Mester, who's a voting FOMC mem- member, said as recently as last night, she thinks it's appropriate to see a Fed funds target rate at, at two and a half percent by the end of the year. And and that possibly, you know, rates should keep going up even beyond that. But you know, one thing you have to remember, too, though, is, is you know, uh, whether we're looking at PCE inflation or or CPI inflation, um, the current, uh, you know, estimate on the Fed, the median estimate for a 2.8 percent, you know, Fed funds rate in 2023, uh, is still well below the inflation. So, you know, it makes us hesitant to think that the Fed is, is still, you know, thinking that it's, it's going to be ahead of this game. Um, it, you just need to see higher rates across, you know, you need to see a Fed punch rate that is above the rate of inflation if you really want to kill inflation. So uh, there's a lot of ground to cover here, a lot of uncertainty in the mix. And, and you know, we think that, you know, the Fed could ultimately prove a hero down the road, but uh, it's, it's going to have to deal with some, I think, some uh, uh, criticism, uh, a lot of criticism until we get there because it's got a lot of ground to make up. Uh, to fight the inflation rates that we're currently seeing. What else do we need to know? Because um, March is turning into uh, maybe a transition month from the steep losses to what are we going to focus on in the next three to six months? I, I'm having a trouble figuring out what this transition is telling us. What's on the horizon that you think is important for us to focus on short term? Well, I think that uh, in the short term, you can get a, a bit of a settling down here. Um, you know, we have had some volatile action. Now we've seen the volatility skewed to the upside here. Um, but I think what, you know, your listeners need to be um, looking out for really is is the, the fundamental backdrop uh, kind of defying the technical backdrop that we're seeing right now. Um, Rising interest rates are going to slow economic growth. Slower economic growth is going to lead to lower earnings growth, and that's going to lead to uh, less of a willingness to, to pay up for, um, you know, for every dollar of earnings. And, uh, you know, we think that we're probably headed more toward a bit of a, a slog here, even in the second half of the year, uh, as the fundamental reality catches up to everyone that, uh, <clears throat> you know, that, it, it's not buy growth at any price. It's, it's not, you know, chase after these profitless stocks <clears throat> um, in that, you know, that you have to be more um, cognizant of, of, of where valuations are and, you know, what, what is truly quality here because the earnings environment is going to get more challenging, we believe, as we move ahead. Uh, and so the market, returns, therefore, are likely to be lower than they have been 
and hopefully we can avoid a negative return this year. But I think, uh, you know, we talked about this on last week's show that I think really a best case scenario for the market this year, if we can even get to that best case scenario is, is increasing in line with the earnings growth. Uh, earnings growth right now is pegged at about 9% in 2022, according to FactSet. But we think those estimates are still too high. And so maybe something more in the low single to mid single digit range would be a best case return scenario right now. But it's going to be a challenge to get to that because we're going to be facing this uh, incessant challenge all year about the Fed raising rates uh, and that being a, a headwind for economic growth. Is there, I kind of want you to talk a little bit about in the last 24 hours, the housing market seems to have taken a hit after Ian Shepherdson said higher rates will equal higher mortgage costs, higher mortgage costs will equal fewer sales. Um, is there a ripple effect when housing kind of hits a snag in the stock market and maybe you could even tie in gold and how these assets all correlate with Bitcoin and Bitcoin going up? It, it seems there's nothing's really working simply right now. The correlation is tough to find. Yeah, it's, I think you know, you're dri- what you're driving at, Rob, I think is, is really it all factors into this feeling of a reduced wealth effect okay. uh, when you talk well about said. whether it's falling, falling real estate prices, falling stock prices, crypto prices coming in. Uh, and that can contribute to uh, lower levels of consumer confidence that ultimately translate into lower levels of discretionary spending. And so it is something to be on the lookout for. And as we can see, this market has been sentiment driven here. And if you get a housing market that has been remarkably strong, uh, and incredibly priced, starting to roll over, uh, that could diminish some of that confidence uh, that has been uh, contributing to higher levels of discretionary spending. What else do we need to know that you're working on that you're taking a look at that uh, might help our insight into the markets? Right. Well, you know, we talked about growth here and our expectation that growth is going to be challenged here as we move uh, uh, into, you know, year end. Um, and uh, kind of what I alluded to a little bit last week, I think, you know, ultimately, where do you go when growth is challenged as an investor? Well, we think you, you basically go to high quality growth stocks, right? We think they'll come back into fashion here. Uh, many of them got hit on the initial fear of higher interest rates, which compressed multiples. Well, the secondary fear here now is that as uh, interest rates move up, you're going to get uh, an economic slowdown. And uh, when you get an economic slowdown, you're going to want to, uh, you know, rotate more into those companies that can deliver above average earnings growth. Uh, so we would expect there to be a transition and more relative strength uh, coming to, to bear in terms of these high quality growth stocks as the year progresses. Thanks very much. It's Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com, a reliable source of domestic and international news tied towards economy, stock markets, businesses. It's a great source of information for IPOs, trading ideas, They've got a list that is one of my favorite lists in the business tied towards value screens. 2022, the year of the value stock, it certainly can cut down on your volatility. A lot of good information from Patrick O'Hare and from briefing.com. I'm Rob Black. Find us at robblackshow.com. Robblackshow.com. Odd things happen. Prepare for the worst, expect the best. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Some things change in a very slow manner. Big, and this is a weird thing to say out loud. Listen to what's about to come out of my mouth. You're not expecting this one. Tornado strikes New Orleans, surrounding areas. People died yesterday from weather. It seems like we live in the 21st century, like, We should have that one covered, but we don't. Lives were ruined in the last 24 hours due to weather. Um, One reported dead outside the city, a tornado that hit parts of New Orleans and surrounding areas has resulted in at least one death and prompted for search and rescue teams to deploy the area. One of the reasons I like Home Depot and Lowe's is long-term investments. Names like William Sonoma is that we will continually build and rebuild and fix and repair and upgrade our housing in the United States. Um, And, you know, this is, uh, I'm in a cycle of year one in a new home where I'm learning, okay, let's see how much winter damaged the house. 
what do I need to do this spring? And I'm starting to do spring work. And guess where I'm going? Ace Hardware, Home Depot, Lowe's, wherever I can to get the, the goods that I need to get. Going to work on some patching of some water damaged areas from the past. You get the idea, right? Okay, let's move forward. This was kind of interesting because I didn't see this one coming. AMC raised prices for the Batman. It was an experiment in the United States to see how badly people wanted to see the movie and would they even notice a dollar or a buck 50 added onto the ticket price? The answer is apparently not. Now, I am cheap, I'm frugal. Dynamic pricing has been in the industry for a long time. And when you have young kids, you're like, well, well let's go see a matinee because it's going to save the family about 40%. So instead of getting $50 a ticket, you can get for four people, you can get $40 a tickets for four people. I love it. Now, what's interesting is I find that movie theaters are still one of the least expensive forms of entertainment. And from my childhood, I remember movie theaters like magic, going to see Indiana Jones and everything else that we saw in movie theaters like Top Gun, the popcorn, the milk duds, the flirting with members of the opposite sex, um, the whole experience of mom and dad dropping us off, knowing that we are kind of safe in an enclosed building. They'll pick us up in two hours. It was magical. And AMC said, let's raise prices a buck, buck 50, see if anyone sees notices or stops coming and they didn't so they had success with dynamic pricing on the high end which is good because we're used to getting discounted rates for kids and discounted rates for matinees and we they can get us to fill out the seats at times where we don't really want to go my kids went to see uncharted uh, with two best friends over the weekend and it was the first time I dropped them at the movies because I don't really want to see the movie. But they had a magical time. And it was just as good as going to a stand-up comedian. It was just as good as going to a concert in LA. It was just as good. They will remember that night in the movie theater as much as they remember the other nights of entertainment that I've given them. Now, movie theaters have already been doing this in Europe for years. But the price hikes that we see in Netflix, we're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. An extra $1, $2. I get it. Yeah, yeah. We got that new Stranger Things. I got that really expensive series we want to see. And Squid Game's coming back out, and I can't miss that one. I'll pay an extra dollar two a month. Not 10, not five, under two. It's not a huge risk. Foot traffic to AMC theaters were up 24% from 2019 and up 68% from 2020. It was a win. It worked. Um, now, it's only going to work with certain tentpole kind of movies, like the Batman and Spider-Man. I'm not going to seek out IMAX to go see the bridges of Madison County. I don't need it. So I think the movie theater industry is kind of switching to, like, big movies. And I'm not going to say they're going to give up on the artsy films. But the artsy films aren't going to pull in what they used to pull in because we can watch the artsy films at home of which Netflix has a new artsy film, Film Noir, shot in Ojai, California. I was like, I think that's going to be a big thing for Ojai real estate because <laughs> it's really cool looking on the screen. If you don't know Ojai, go look it up today. It's O-J-A-I. It's just a weird looking place in California. And celebrities like weird looking places. Okay, so Phoenix, a couple months ago, I looked up uh, a journalist friend who went to Phoenix for a robo taxi trip. His boss said, go to Phoenix and take a robo taxi and tell us your experience. Take it from your hotel to like a Whole Foods. And the video shot made me very nervous. He was very nervous. Pull it in the parking lot was probably the most nerve wracking. I've asked my producer in radio, when are you going to get into a robo taxi? He goes, no time soon. And I kind of feel the same way. I, I think I'd get into a taxi from the airport to a hotel, you know, something that is a pre-programmed route with maybe one alternative. Okay, if there's traffic, go the other way. I don't know if I want to be like lost in the city in a robo taxi. My stress levels would go up way high. But robo taxi, robo taxis are coming. It's the first expansion outside of Phoenix. Waymo is set to make its ride-hailing service fully driverless on the heavy streets of San Francisco. 
which means no safety driver in the front seat of a Jaguar I-Pace vehicle. We've seen these taxis all over Golden Gate now. Waymo has been valued at more than $30 billion, and they're taking the driver away. So far, over 10,000 robo taxi rides have been completed since the program entitled Trusted Testers um, has been implemented. How do you feel about robo taxis? Because they're kind of here now. The rollout will still be slow and stunted, and there'll be problems, but they're kind of here now. Pete Bodujig, this transportation secretary, said a new role is important, establishing robust safety standards. Yeah, I think so too. The way forward, robos, taxis. Interesting. What does that do to the taxi industry? I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. That is an example of labor being eliminated. Watch out what you wish for, employees of Starbucks unionizing. Irreverent, over the top, and smart as a whip. This is the Rob Black Show.